Today's video is targeted at those who are new to investing in precious metals, particularly gold and silver, but it should also serve as a useful reminder for those seasoned old hands. This is the first in a much requested mini-series exploring the importance of financial self-defense. This is arguably more important than ever right now, so let's dive on in. Now this channel provides global macro insights and champions the importance of sound money in a world gone crazy, so please do consider subscribing. For millennia, gold and silver have been used as money and a true store of value. In fact, they have been the predominant form of money when they were first minted into coins in Lydia around 680 BC. Yet a war has constantly been waged upon gold and silver by our authorities and our banking systems who prefer us to use their infinite fiat currency. Fiat simply meaning through a formal authorization or proposition a decree. Gold and silver scarcity act as shackles upon the ability of a country's financial sector and its government to be able to grow in size and power. And as Mike Maloney highlights in his excellent 10 part series, The Hidden Secrets of Money, which I'll link to in the description, it really is a must watch. Fiat currency is a currency as it does not act as a true store of value due to its infinite nature. Currency is designed to lose value year after year as this excellent graphic shows us from 1913. And so central banks who are in charge of a country's monetary policy, uh, which is simply about how they choose to influence how much currency is in the country's economy, will generally target a 2% level of inflation on their own consumer price index measurements. So that is a 2% average decline in purchasing power and this has a compounding effect year after year. But of course this inflation measurement has many limitations, for instance not truly reflecting housing costs. And so this chart from the excellent site WTF happened in 1971.com illustrates the value of major currencies uh, against that of gold over the last hundred years or so. An ounce of gold or silver does not truly change in value, it remains an ounce of gold or silver. Yet the value of currencies do change as we, see, as we can clearly see here. Or alternatively, in this chart from Crescat Capital, which highlights the globally synchronized debasement of fiat currency. Without question, this trend of debasing currencies through increasing uh, cu the currency supply is set to continue. What's more is that physical gold and silver have no counterparty risk and this means that they are widely regarded as the safest form of assets to hold in an economic downturn as John Exter's inverse pyramid illustrates to us where the riskiest assets are at the top of the pyramid and the least risky and most liquid assets are at its pinnacle. And so this leads us to uh, consider the factors that result in higher fiat currency denominated gold and silver prices. Traditionally, if we consider the actual major gold and silver highs of 1980 and 2011, this has coincided with a period of low or even negative real interest rates and rising energy costs, most notably through higher oil prices. In this table from Gold Money's uh, Alastair McLeod, we can see the impact of negative real rates on Treasury inflation protected securities. Along the top row and the oil price along the left hand column, which helps to inform us of uh, inflationary expectations, where precious metals are seen as protection from inflation. He then forecasts the resultant gold price in the body of the table as we can see here. Traditionally, central banks cut interest rates in the midst of a crisis by at least 5.5%. Yet upon entering this crisis, America's uh, central bank, the Federal Reserve, had interest rates at 1.75%. Will we see minus 3.75% interest rates therefore? Well, this is highly unlikely, but with so much debt in our economies, uh, 
interest rates cannot be allowed to rise. And while central banks will not take interest rates as far negative as that, they are likely to make up for it via the vast quantities of quantitative easing that they engage upon. Now, quantitative easing is essentially an asset swap between the central bank and their closest cronies in the financial sector who are known as primary dealers. They then receive reserves plus fat fees, which then are held at the central bank. The central bank will receive government and even corporate bonds in return. The sale of these corporate bonds may encourage the large corporations who have benefited then to buy back stock and prop up the wider asset prices. And according to many analysts, it is now this factor, the growth in the central bank's balance sheet that determines the potential gold and silver price growth. With the economic outlook still uh, remaining dire, it's a near certainty that we can expect our central banks to conduct further bouts of quantitative easing and socialism for the rich, which will expand their assets on their balance sheet. In addition, we can expect the government's fiscal situation to continue to deteriorate as deficits gap ever wider and national debts soar. Additionally, given that commodities are priced in dollars, it's worth considering dollar strength. The dollar has been weakening uh, considerably since uh, seeing real strength in March. While in the face of another crisis, we're sure to see the dollar spike higher. It's worth considering where you see the value of the dollar going going in the longer term. Amidst a backdrop of uh, currency creation, escalating national debts globally and other problems that we've looked at previously such as the uh, dollar standard, it's likely in my view that the dollar will continue to lose purchasing power in the longer term. One other point to bear in mind is that silver's price outlook is also influenced by the level of industrial demand. Consequently, silver will often do better as industrial demand begins to recover in a reflationary period after much stimulus. And so what should you be buying, gold or silver? Well, there's a little saying which just goes along the lines of gold for stability and silver for gains. Gold's market size is uh, far larger than that of silver, and many tend to hold gold as a form of long-term insurance. This generally means that the gold price experiences far less volatility than that of the silver price. Silver is more affordable and requires far smaller inflow of capital to drive price gains. Now, if we look at silver from a historical perspective, uh, we would have to class silver as a high risk, high reward asset. Yet there's good reason to see this period as the end of a 50 year debt super cycle uh, that will see the need for a complete reset of the monetary system based upon sound money. In that case, silver is likely to gain handsomely. A key metric many use in determining what to buy is through the gold-silver ratio. This simply tells us at current prices how many ounces of silver equates to one ounce of gold. The long-term historic ratio is around 15 to 1, but for the 20th century the gold-silver ratio averaged 47 to 1. Essentially this tells us that when the ratio is considerably above the average, silver represents better value than that of gold. For instance, with the ratio at just below 80 to 1 right now, my focus is far more uh, on silver. However, I'm fortunate to also have a strong, stable base of gold, which as we said, offers me that stability in my portfolio. But silver offers the potential for real gains, and I and many others believe silver will move further and faster than gold in coming years, just as it did when the ratio hit lows in 1980 and 2011. So that's our first introduction to precious metals video. Do let me know your comments and any questions you have. Next time we'll be considering why we need to store our wealth outside of the banking system. So thanks so much for joining me. Do consider subscribing and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye bye.